Hi, and welcome to my presentation. My name is Daniela Clapper de Andrade, and I will talk about a genetic algorithm with deep learning based guided mutations to improve the Novo peptide sequencing. Mass spectrometry is a commonly used tool for studying proteomes which play a crucial role in any living organism. For peptide identification, proteins are first digested into peptides which are shorter chains of amino acids. In our example, this protein gets digested into at least three peptides, one of them being peptide. In a second stage, peptides are separated, ionized, and fragmented. In this project, we consider B and Y ion fragments, which are the most common ion types in most mass spectrometry experiments. In an ideal case, at each amino acid position, the peptide gets fragmented, and in this case, we get the ion B1 to B4 and the complementary ions Y1 and Y4. After fragmentation, the ionized fragments are captured and analyzed in the mass spectrometer. The output of this experimental phase are so-called tandem mass or MS2 spectra, which are essentially a collection of mass to charge, MZ ratios and intensity values. Now, based on these experimental spectra, there are two main approaches for peptide identification. The first one is database searching, which is still the most commonly used method in the field. Database searching relies on a reference database of the organism of interest. Here, the peptides are identified by generating theoretical spectra from the given database and comparing the experimental spectra with the theoretical ones to find the closest matches. The second approach for peptide identification is the novo sequencing, which allows identifying peptides directly from the spectra without depending on a database. The approach is gaining popularity in the field as it allows identifying novel peptides or detecting post-translational modifications and can be therefore used in many applications, including genotyping and immuno-oncology. So what is the main idea of the novo sequencing? We start from the basis that the mass difference between two fragment ions corresponds to the mass of an amino acid of the peptide sequence. For example, as you can see on the left, the difference between the ions Y3 and Y2 corresponds to the mass of proline. In a perfect hypothetical spectrum, all peaks corresponding to B and or Y fragments are present in the spectrum. The sequences can be then easily reconstructed by just reading out the MZ differences of the peaks. I guess you will then agree with me that this task becomes trivial if all corresponding peaks and no other peaks are present in the spectrum and if the peaks are labeled by the ion types, in this case B and Y ions. Now, having a look at an actual experimental spectrum for the same peptide pepti, we will realize that this task is actually not trivial. We see that there are many contamination peaks, meaning that these are not attributed to fragments of the sequence. These contamination peaks are colored in black in our example. Also, there are many peaks that are missing, in this case the Y1 and the Y2. Even if some peaks are present, such as the B1 in the example, we see that these peaks are less abundant than contamination peaks, which makes the reconstruction of the sequence harder. There have been many good advances in the field in the last years. However, the peptide recall remains limited at high precision ranges. This makes highly accurate and real-time de novo sequencing still challenging in practice. Our contribution to the field can be divided into three parts. First, we frame the task of ion series labeling, meaning whether a pig belongs to a certain type or not, as an image-to-image -image translation task and introduce a custom convolutional layer. Second, we establish a scoring procedure to evaluate the correctness of any peptide spectrum matching. And finally, we combine these two ideas into an optimization procedure to correct peptide candidates from existing tools in a genetic algorithm. Let me start by introducing the first part of our project. We first consider the task of labeling peaks in a spectrum with a certain ion type as an image-to-image -image translation task. For this, we discretize the mass-to-charge axis of the spectrum and consider each spectrum as a one-dimensional vector. As a first input channel, we aggregate the experimental intensities in each one Dalton bin. It is a flexible framework so that we can also add more channels 
to the input such as the maximal experimental intensity in a one Dalton bin. Based on this image, we want to train a model that for each pin predicts the cross probability that this pin corresponds to an ion type, in this example to singly charged B ions. We can build on prior work from Matthias Wilhelm Matum, who has done a strong contribution on the field with PROSIT. PROSIT is a deep learning model that predicts the expected peak intensities for B and Y ions. In the example in this slide, we compare the experimental and process predicted intensities for the top two sequences after database searching. We see that for the highest ranked peptide on the right, the predicted and experimental intensities do not match so good as for the second ranked peptide on the right. In this case, with PROSIT, we would be able to conclude that the second peptide sequence is the correct sequence for that given spectrum. We're going to make use of PROSIT for our methods, and we leverage not only PROSIT, but also existing the Novo sequencing tool. Our proposal is to correct the bin ion classes of candidate peptides which are incorrect. We term this task as bin reclassification. As shown here in red, ideally, the model should be able to recognize incorrect bin classes corresponding to incorrect residues in the peptide sequence. In this particular case, the model would tell us that the amino acids T and P need to be swapped. We formulate this task as a binary classification problem for every ion type, in this case B and Y ions. The experimental intensities, initial bin classes and predicted intensities by PROSIT serve as input channels to the model. The output of our bin reclassification model are the class probabilities for B and Y ion types for every bin. Our model for bin reclassification is in principle a convolutional neural network with custom convolutions which allow us to deal with sparsity. The sparsity of our input image comes from the fact that even if there are no missing peaks in the spectrum, peaks can be separated by 186 bins considering the heaviest amino acid tryptophan. We designed our amino acid gap convolution with spacings that corresponds to amino acid masses. The intuition behind that is that in a spectrum, peaks from the same ion series are spaced by molecular masses of amino acids. We currently include the 20 canonical amino acids and the modification of methionine in our filters, but other modification and neutral losses could be incorporated as well. We train and test our method on a large human data set with 19 tissues and approximately 4 million peptide spectrum matches. We obtain or correct peptide sequences with MaxQuan at 1% FDR and incorrect peptide sequences from the Novo sequencing tools Novo, PNovo3 and Casanovo. We split the peptide spectrum matches by correct peptide for the construction of train, validation and test set so that no correct peptide is present in both train and test sets. I want to show you now an example of how our binary classification model works in practice. Let me guide you through this slide. You see the process predicted and the experimental spectra of an incorrect peptide sequence. I marked in orange the amino acids in the sequence which are incorrect and the corresponding Y peaks of these amino acids in gray in the spectra. In the plot, you can also see as black dots the change probability suggested by your model. A high change probability implies that the model is suggesting a change of label for that bin. In this particular example, in the bin of the Y2 ion, the model is suggesting with a probability of approximately 0.7 that there should not be a Y ion at this bin. In the second gray area, our model predicts two changes of label with a high probability, implying that the Y12 ion needs to be shifted to the left. Now, I will show you the correct sequence and the predicted and experimental spectrum for this sequence. The experimental spectra of the correct and incorrect sequence are equal, and the process spectra only differ at the marked gray areas. In the first gray area, we see that in the correct sequence there is really not a Y ion present. Similarly, in the second gray area, our bin reclassification model correctly predicts the position of the correct Y ion. Now, I would like to show you the global performance of our model at bin level with precision recall curves for B and Y ions. We compare our performance to the initial precision and recall at bin level of the two Casanova. 
As you can see in the plot, at Casanova's initial recall, we improved the precision by 55 for Y ions and by 39% for B ions. And at Casanova's initial precision, we improved the recall by 20% for Y ions and by 15% for B ions. The illustrated precision recall curves and their relative improvements are computed on the tissue tonsil. We obtained similar performance on test set for all other tissues. These can be seen in the box plots which show the relative improvement of the precision and recall compared to the input pin labels for the tools Novor and Casano. Now, how do we actually obtain better peptide sequence from our bin ring classification model? As I told you before, we pass the bin labels of the input peptide and the experimental spectrum to our model to obtain class probabilities for each ion type. Based on these probabilities, we leverage the concept of a spectrum graph that has been developed in the field before. For each bin with a high predicted probability, we introduce a node in the graph with the corresponding MZ value. We construct an edge between two nodes if the MZ difference between the nodes is approximately the mass of an amino acid and label the edge accordingly. We introduce a source and target node with MZ values derived from the experimental mass of the peptide sequence. Finding a peptide sequence in the graph, fulfilling the mass constraint, is equivalent to finding a path from source to target. As you can see in this example, there can be multiple paths from source to target, meaning that more than one peptide sequence can be found. To obtain k new peptide sequences, which are not necessarily unique, we run k-weighted random walks from source to target, favoring paths that go through nodes with high probabilities. In this example, with k equal to 2, we obtain the peptide sequences SEGR and SWR. Notice that SWR is also the input peptide of this example, meaning that the input peptide may also be returned by your algorithm. Now, if we are able to obtain more than one peptide sequence from our algorithm, how do we rank the obtained sequences to propose the final peptide sequence for a given spectrum? This question leads us to the second part of the project. Here, we propose a scoring procedure for precisely evaluating the correctness of a peptide sequence to a given spectrum. We suggest to evaluate peptide candidates by estimating the number of single amino acid edits of this peptide candidate to the correct peptide sequence. Formally, the string distance that calculates the number of substitution operations needed to transform one string into the other is called edit or Levenstein distance. A Levenstein distance of zero means that the candidate peptide is exactly equal to the correct peptide. Larger distances imply that in sequence space, the peptide candidate is farther away from the correct peptide. We train a random force regressor based on approximately 100 features. In the features, we include similarity metrics between the experimental and process predicted spectra such as the spectral angle and the Euclidean distance between both spectra. Also, we define the number of predicted bin class changes by your bin reclassification model at certain probability thresholds as further features of our model. We evaluated our trained model on initial peptide candidates by the tools Novor and Casanova. As you can see on each facet, for both Novor and Casanova, there is a high agreement between the actual Levenstein distances displayed on the x-axis and the predicted Levenstein distances displayed on the y-axis. For correct peptide sequences, meaning for those that have an actual Levenstein distance of zero, we mostly predict lower Levenstein distances than for the rest of the sequences. This is a good indicator that our model is able to discriminate correct from incorrect peptide candidates. Now, we can use our scoring function to rescore and therefore re-rank peptide identifications from existing de novo sequencing tools. In this scenario, we do not modify the peptide identifications by the method, but only assign them a new score, obtained from our trained random forest. By rescoring peptide candidates, we aim to better separate correct from incorrect peptide candidates. We can now compare the precision and recall curves before and after rescoring. As you can see in this slide, 
by rescoring initial Casanova identifications on the tissue tonsil, we managed to improve the recall by 29% at 90% precision. Similarly, we rescored initial peptide identifications by Novo and Casanovo for all, the, all other tissues in your dataset. As you can see in the box plot at the right of this slide, the recall at 90% precision substantially improves after rescoring the initial peptide candidates. Having established our model for bin reclassification and our scoring procedure, we now come to the third part of our project, where we combine the two first parts into a genetic algorithm to correct erroneous peptide candidates from existing de novo sequencing tools. For each experimental spectrum, instead of focusing on one single solution, we're going to work in parallel on an entire population of peptide candidates. At a particular generation N, we have a fixed population of peptides. For this, we compute a fitness. Afterwards, we select a particular set of individuals based on their fitness. Higher fitness imply a higher probability of selection. For the fitness computation, we use our previously trained model to estimate Levenstein distances. We then mutate the selected individuals of the current generation to obtain the peptide candidates for the next generation. We do this by means of our binary classification model and the previously described spectrum graph algorithm. After a certain number of generations, we stop the procedure and return for each spectrum the highest scored peptide sequence. We test our genetic algorithm with starting sequences from Casanovo and from Novor if the mass of Casanovo sequence does not match the experimental mass. We show precision and recall curves at peptide level for peptide identifications in original scores of Novor and Casanovo in orange and blue and compare it to our precision recall curve by our method with our scores. At 90% precision, the recall increases by 42% and the overall recall improves by 22% with respect to Casano. Similarly, for all other tissues in the dataset, we compare the recall at 90% precision of Novor, Casanovo, and our method. And we show that we improve this recall at 90% precision substantially. In conclusion, in this project, we propose modeling innovations that could be leveraged independently, namely, pin reclassification as a new model task, based on a novel convolutional layer which considers amino acid gaps, and a fitness function to evaluate any peptide spectrum matches. We make use of these innovations in an genetic algorithm which improves the performance of existing de novo sequencing tools on a considered human dataset. More extensive analysis and benchmarks are on the way, and with that I want to thank Julian Gagneur and Johannes Hengel, who is a master student in our lab. And thank you to Jakob Treible and August Kultepe who did previous work on this project and a huge thank you to Matthias Wilhelm at Tom with whom we're having an exciting and fun collaboration on this project. Contact us via email if you have any questions or visit our lab webpage and with that thank you very much.